Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Redeeming the time. God knows how many minutes I will be alive. It's a secret bank account, Colossians 4 verse 5. As I trade each minute for this life of mine, I must be wise and I must make the most of my time. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Redeeming the time, oh, redeeming the time, oh, redeeming the time. All right, let's uh, get started in uh, today's lesson. And we are going to continue to look at the Holy Scriptures and we are going to be looking at the attacks on the Holy Scriptures. Now we are up to part number seven and we have been spending uh, quite a bit of time when it comes uh, to the attacks on the Holy Scriptures. And you've seen that these attacks have come from various sources in our studies thus far. But over the last couple of lessons, we have been looking at the attacks uh, on the Holy Scriptures when it comes to the Satanic versions. And uh, in particular, we've been looking at the New International Virus, uh, sorry, I mean the New International uh, Version, and seeing where that has been uh, attacking uh, the Holy Scriptures. And in our last two messages, we, we've had a look at where it's uh, attacked the Holy Scriptures when it comes to uh, the truth, or I should say Bible truths or truths found in the Word of God. Uh, John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So we've seen examples, and I've given you a, 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 a wide range of uh, Bible truths where the New International Version has uh, attacked uh, this book. And in today's lesson, I'll give you a number of verses, and Lord willing, we'll try and get through uh, every single one. But just so you know, there are thousands out there. I've just picked a, picked a handful uh, through my studies and just uh, gone through some, some passages and just highlighted some uh, for you to see the extent of where the New International Version attacks not just Bible truths, but attacks the truth. And when we're talking about the truth, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that reference there in John chapter 14 and verse 6, where the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So we'll see where the New International Version attacks uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should reveal to you straight away that if there is a Bible version on the market that attacks the Lord Jesus Christ, straight away you should know or have a, a suspicion that that is not the Bible version to be using and that is not the Bible version that God gave us. Uh, where would that Bible version come from? Who would be the author? Who would be the spirit behind uh, that Bible version that attacks the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, when we come to the conclusion of our teaching today, I'm sure that you will be fully persuaded in your own mind that uh, the author of that or the spirit behind that is a satanic uh, spirit. Now, let me just remind you, because as we as we look at these examples uh, in the scriptures once again, we're going to, to further see these uh, characteristics of Satan when it comes to the NIV attacking the truth here uh, in the Holy Scriptures. Remember those characteristics of Satan when he attacked the Word of God there in Genesis. Firstly, he caused doubt upon the words of God. He did this by being subtle. Secondly, he defiled the Word of God and he was very slick in the way he did this. He added to the Scriptures, he added to the Word of God and he subtracted from the Word of God. And then thirdly, 
He deceives concerning the word of God. He does this by being a smooth talker there in Genesis chapter 3. And he mixes truth with error. Uh, and that's what you're going to find in the New International Version as well as all the other versions out there on the market. That uh, they do conceive, deceive concerning the words of God because there is some truth found in there. You know, they're not going to attack every Bible truth in their version. But it is mixed with error and we saw that error in the last two messages we'll continue to see those errors in this message as well so it has a little bit of truth but it's mixed with error as a result of that it becomes defiled uh, it cannot be called pure they cannot be called pure words i don't know why they write holy bible on the front because there's nothing holy uh, about them uh, in any way so let's get started if you do have a copy of the new international version uh, make that available to yourselves as well so you could uh, Follow those references and uh, and check them out. Um, at the same time, make sure you do have uh, the Holy Scriptures in front of you, and let's uh, see what uh, uh, the Holy Scriptures say when it when it comes here, and uh, when we look at these examples where the New International Version attack uh, the truth. And remember, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So, firstly, go to the Book of Colossians. I just want to uh, to show you this uh, verse before we get into looking at these examples. Colossians chapter one. And verse number 18, this is uh, in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it reads here in verse 18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So who is the one that is meant to have the preeminence here in verse number 18? Well, the context is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in how many things does he or is he ought to have the preeminence? It says in all things. Now, just a question for, for all of us. Does the Lord Jesus Christ have the preeminence in, in our lives as we live our lives day by day? Uh, does the Lord Jesus Christ uh, have the preeminent place in our hearts? Or do we decide to, to live for ourselves? Do we live after the flesh or do we die daily? Are we crucified with Christ? And as a result of doing that, the Lord Jesus Christ has a preeminence in our, in our hearts. Does he have the preeminence in our thoughts? Does he have the preeminence uh, place in our families, uh, in our home life? Does he have the preeminent place uh, in our church? Or is some, some man elevated to a position of being uh, in a preeminent place? You know, the scriptures say that he ought to have the preeminent place in all things. You know what else comes under that all? You know, the scriptures come under that place of being all things. So I want you to, to keep this thought in mind that when we look at these examples in the New International Version and compare them to the authorized version, which form of scriptures, and again, I use that term loosely when I'm referring to the New International Version, gives the Lord Jesus Christ the preeminent place. And keep in the back of your mind as well, who would want to make sure that the Lord Jesus Christ does not have the preeminent place in the Holy Scriptures? And again, we've already answered that question, but I just want you to consider it uh, for yourself. And as again, as we look at these illustrations, that you too would be fully persuaded, not by what I say, but what the evidence says as it's laid out uh, in front of you. All right, so let's get started now. Let's have a look at the Gospel of Matthew to start off with. Matthew chapter number 8. As you're turning there, I hope that uh, everyone has had uh, a blessed week and the Lord's been uh, ministering to you uh, through his word and that uh, you've been able to, to spend some quality time uh, with him and uh, being able to, to cast any care that you have uh, at his feet and that you have been strengthened in his might uh, day by day. Matthew chapter 8. Let's look at verse number 1. And it says this, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Again, this is in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number two, it says, and behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. This leper comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says here that this leper came and worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ. This leper knew exactly who this man was, that this was no ordinary man. And we know that because he calls him Lord. And it says that he came and worshipped him. Do you know what the New International Version does in this verse? The New International Version removes the word worship 
and replaces it uh, with with words stating that uh, this leper came and kneeled down or this leper knelt down. So it doesn't say that this leper worshipped the Lord, it just says that he knelt down. Let's have a look at another example. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, look at verse 18. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. So this man comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's got a sick daughter. And what does he do here in verse number 18? It says that he worshipped. He worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he knew who this man was. This was uh, the, the uh, God manifested uh, in the flesh. And you know what the NIV does here in verse number 18? Again, just like it did in chapter 8 and verse 2, it removes the word worship and replaces it with uh, knelt down or kneel down. Why would the New International Version remove the word worship here in these two examples? You want another one? Go to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. And look with me here at... Uh, let's look at, let's look at verse 24. Again, this is the Lord Jesus Christ here. And he says to this particular woman, he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, then came she and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. You know what the NIV does in this verse, just like it did in those other two examples. It removes the word worship and again replaces it with kneel down or, or knelt down. Um, you want another one? Let's go to another one. Shall I'm just showing you that it's not just one occasion that the New International Version does this. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And look at verse number, verse number 20. It reads this. Then came to him, again, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. What does the NIV do in this verse? The NIV once again removes the word worshipping and replaces it with knelt down or kneel down. Now, just a simple question for us to answer. Is kneeling down or bowing down the same thing as worshipping? Well, it's a simple question, but it's a simple answer as well. Of course it is not. There's a complete difference between worshipping and bowing down or, or kneeling down. So why would the NIV take out the word worshipping here from these verses and replace it with kneeling down or bowing down? You know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement is nothing new because according to the New International Version, they were practicing the uh, taking the knee back there when they translated their version of the so-called of their so-called holy scriptures. You want to see this in uh, in uh, illustration today. Watch the English Premier League football, and before kickoff, before the teams start the game, what do those players do? They bow down and take the knee. Both sets of players, the referee, the coaches, they all take the knee, and what are they doing? Are they worshiping? No, they're not worshipping. All they're doing is just bowing a knee. And that's exactly what the NIV teaches in these examples, that these people are not coming to Jesus to worship him for who he is, God manifested in the flesh. All they're doing is just taking a knee. See, Black Lives Matter was uh, was present there in the New International Version many years ago when it was, uh, when it was translated. Another spirit behind it. Who's trying to take away the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I told you earlier that the New International Version is very subtle because it's not going to change all those references to worship when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you look at Matthew chapter 14 and verse 33, Matthew chapter 28 and verses 9 and 17 in the New International Versions, they keep the word worship there in those references when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are they doing? They're mixing truth with error. And what's one of the characteristics of Satan that we saw at the beginning? He deceives concerning the word of God. Let me give you another example of this to show you that there is a difference. Look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And 
Look at uh, verse 29. This is just before the crucifixion uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Matthew chapter 27, look at verse 29. It reads this. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head. Now, these are the persecutors of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what it says. And a reed in his right hand. Look what it says. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. So these persecutors of the Lord Jesus Christ here, just before his persecution, it says that they bowed the knee. Now, are they worshipping him? No, they're not worshipping, are they? They're making a mockery of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Whereas, when you, again, when you read this verse in the New International Version, they say words of similar effect, that yes, they, they bowed the knee. So if you use the New International Version as your authority or as your version of the, of the Scriptures, they have those uh, individuals, those references that we looked at where they take out the word worship and people uh, take the knee, bow the knee, kneel, what, whatever they do. It's the same thing these persecutors of the Lord Jesus Christ are doing here in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 29. Notice that the authorized version makes a difference between bowing the knee and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, whereas in the New International Version, there's uh, uh, no difference uh, whatsoever. So who is behind the New International Version or what sort of spirit is behind the New International Version? Examples here of where they attack the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 and look at verse 33. Luke 2 and verse 33, we read this. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Now, this is in reference to the earthly parents of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what the authorized version says. It says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. You want to know what the New International Version does in this verse? They replace the word Joseph and insert the word Father, so in the NIV it will read, and and his father and his mar mother marvelled at those things. Well, hang on a minute, no, no, that's again, once again, an attack on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The authorized version was very clear and very careful to make sure that in this verse it says Joseph and his mother, not his father and his mother. Why? Because when the Lord Jesus Christ lived on this earth. In his earthly ministry, not one time did he refer to Joseph as his father. So why does the New International Version refer to Joseph as the father of the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me give you an example of this. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. John 17 and look at verse, um, let's have a look at verse, yeah, verse verse 1, sorry. <laughs> My eyes are going in another place. In John chapter 17, look at verse number 1. This is a prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour the hour has come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So who did the Lord Jesus Christ refer to? as his father in his earthly ministry. He didn't refer to Joseph as his father. He referred to uh, his father, which is up in heaven, uh, God the Father, uh, God the Creator, God Almighty. That is who the father of the Lord Jesus Christ is. So why in this verse would the New International Version take out the word Joseph and replace it with father? Why? Because it's an attack on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to Acts now. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And let's look at let's look at verse number 13. We read this. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So the authorized version says uh, that he's glorified his son, Jesus. Now, what does the New International Version do in this verse? Well, the New International Version takes out the word son 
and replaces it with the word servant. Now, why would the New International Version take out the word son and replace it with the word servant? Was the Lord Jesus Christ God's servant? Well, yes, he was. We understand that. But at the same time, we read here in Acts 3 verse 13, we see another verse proving the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord Jesus Christ is God's son. And it says specifically in this verse that he has glorified his son Jesus, where the NOV now comes in and attacks this verse, takes out the word son and replaces it with the word servants. Why would they do that for? I'll tell you why they do that for, because there's another spirit behind that translation of the scriptures. Now, there are many religious groups out there today that would like that uh, change in the New International Version. Let me think. Ah, the Jehovah's Witnesses are a group that would like that change in that uh, particular verse. So would the Mormons, and so would the uh, Mohammedans, uh, the religion of Islam. And I'll call them Mohammedans because they're followers of Muhammad. So the Mohammedans would like this verse as well in verse number 13. Why? Because they all teach, those three religious systems teach that Jesus Christ is not God's son. So a Jehovah's Witness would be happy to use a New International Version. A Mormon would be happy to use a New International Version. And a Mohammedan would be happy to turn to a New International Version because in this verse, it attacks the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and when you read this verse in the New International Version, it shows us that the Lord Jesus Christ, all he was, was God's servant, not God's son, as the authorized version clearly tells us here in Acts chapter 3 and verse number 13. Drop down to verse 26, the same chapter, all right, the same chapter here, Acts chapter 3 and look at verse 26. What saith the scriptures? Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Now, what does the NIV do in this verse? Well, it does exactly the same thing that it did there in verse number 13, but at the same time, it goes a step further. So they would take out the word son and replace it with the word servants. Look what it says, unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus. Again, you've got the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ right in front of you here in this verse. That God had a son and his son was the Lord Jesus Christ. The NIV comes in and attacks that uh, verse, takes out the word son, replaces it with servant. And you know what else the NIV does here in this verse? It takes out the word Jesus. Takes out the name Jesus. Jesus. Why would they take out the name Jesus for from this verse? So in the NIV, it would read God having raised up his servant and leave it at that and then mention the rest of the verse. So it takes out um, son and takes out Jesus. Again, another attack on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've only seen a handful of examples thus far, but that verse that I showed you at the beginning, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, when you compare the New International Version with the authorized version, just in those small examples we've seen thus far, which version of the scriptures is giving the Lord Jesus Christ the preeminent place? Is it the new international version or is it the authorized version, the holy scriptures that we have in front of us? Let's continue to look at these examples. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and let's look at let's look at verse 47 it reads this the first man is of the earth earthy that's talking about who well if you back up a little bit you'll see that's talking about Adam it says the second man is the Lord from heaven so who's in this reference to this is in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ now what does the NIV do in this verse while it removes the two words, the Lord. So in the NIV, it would read the first man is the earth earthly. The second man is from heaven. And you don't know, according to the NIV from that verse, who is this second man from heaven? Because they take out the word 
Lord. Again, why would the NIV do this for? Why not just leave it the way it is? Why? Because there's a subtle attack on the Holy Scriptures by the NIV. Let's take out the word Lord here from 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 47. Go over to Galatians. Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter 4. And let's have a look at verse number 6 just for context, context sake. It says, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You remember we, we looked at that verse when we looked at our, uh, our message on, on Father's Day there in September. Look what it says in verse number 7. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How do we become an heir of God? The scriptures make it clear we become an heir of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord Jesus Christ needed to die, needed to be buried, needed to be risen again from the dead. We needed to put our faith and trust in his finished work at Calvary. As a result of that, the scriptures tell us we can be an heir of God through Christ. How important it is to, to note that it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. So with the NIV... And the spirit behind the NIV and the translators of the New International Version, knowing how important that is, what do they do when they come to this verse here in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 7? Can you believe it? They take out the words through Christ, just like that. So this verse would read, Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God. Full stop. Why would they take out through Christ? Again, they're attacking the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not giving the Lord Jesus Christ the preeminent place in their version of the scriptures. Another example, you're in Galatians, go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter number 3 and look at verse number 9. We read this, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Once again here, an example here in Ephesians chapter 3, we have a proof of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord Jesus Christ was present with God the Father there at the beginning of creation. It says, which was from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Well, I thought God created all things. In the beginning, God created. Well, according to the authorized version, we can see straight away, and it's a great uh, cross-reference to show us that Jesus Christ is God. So again, when you have these cults knocking on your doors, or you have these cults out there putting their rubbish in your letterboxes, and they uh, deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can see from this verse, once again in the authorized version, a proof text that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. So knowing that, with the NIV knowing that, what does the NIV do in this verse? Would you believe it? You probably would believe it by now after the examples we've seen thus far. They remove the words by Jesus Christ. Why would they do that for? Why would they remove the words by Jesus Christ? So it would read that from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things. Full stop. Whereas the authorized version gives the Lord Jesus Christ the preeminent place in creation by saying by Jesus Christ. Another example where the New International Version does not give the Lord Jesus Christ the preeminent place. You know, there's power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Satan knows that. And that's why Satan is behind the New International Version, the translation of that version, that version being on the market today. We've seen, that's why I've told you from the beginning, it is a satanic version, and Satan is behind that. There's another spirit, it's not the Holy Spirit, behind that version of the Scriptures like the authorized version that we have in front of us. We've seen just... A handful here of examples where the name of the Lord Jesus Christ has been taken out, just been removed, just been thrown in the garbage heap. 
Why? Because there's power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Satan knows this. He doesn't want the readers of the NIV to, to, to understand that there's power in that name. How do we know there's power in that name? Let's go. Let me show you two examples here in Acts. Firstly, in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter number 4. And read with me here in verse number 10. We read this. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the name of Jesus Christ, this is who we're talking about here. It says, Whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. The apostles here he healed a man that uh, was not able to walk and saying the reason why this man was healed was because of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's power in that name. It says, verse 11, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now look at verse number 12. He says, Neither is there salvation in any other. So salvation cannot be found in Buddha. Salvation cannot be found in Muhammad. Salvation cannot be found in any pope. Salvation cannot be found in any political leader. Salvation can only be found in one name. He's going to tell you this. Neither is salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. When you got saved, what was the name that you got saved under? It was the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in Acts chapter 16 and verse 31 with that Philippian jailer, when he said to, to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, to show you how powerful this name is. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 9. We read here, Wherefore God, has, God also hath highly exalted him, who is he referring to here? You'll see he's talking about Jesus Christ. God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is above every name. It says in verse 10 that at the name of who? Read it with me now. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These are just two examples I've shown you to, to, to see how powerful the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is. There's power in that name. And what does the New International Version do? The New International Version rips that name out of their scriptures. Look at Psalm 139. You've seen how powerful the name is. But look what God says in his word about his name and about his word. Psalm 139. Sorry, Psalm 138. Always get those two mixed up. Psalm 138, look at verse number 2. It says, I will worship toward thy holy temple, Psalm of David, I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. It says, For thou hast magnified thy words... For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So we've seen how elevated the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is. We've seen how powerful the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is. But in the scriptures we see that God has done what? He's magnified his word above all his name. His word is higher than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So why would the New International Version come in, not just attack the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ, but attack the word, the truth that we have in front of us. Why? Because God's elevated it above his very name. Can you see who's behind the New International Version? Look at uh, another example here, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and this is this particular verse is, is a great promise that, that we've uh, preached on in, in lockdown, and uh, I'm sure that you, you've claimed it a, a number of times in your Christian lives, and we need it every day, and we need to be reminded of it every day. Philippians 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Well, you can't do that if you're reading a New International Version. What's the source of your strength? 
here in this verse, in the authorized version, the source of our strength is Christ. I can do all things through who? Through Christ. There's that name again. There's power in that name. So what does the NIV do when it comes to this verse? It takes out the word Christ and replaces it with through him. There's no power in the word him. There's no power in the name him. There's power in the name of Christ. So someone who reads the New International Version cannot claim this verse. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. There's the source of your power through Christ. Why would they come in and attack this verse for? Because Satan does not want you dying daily in your Christian walk and making and making you understand or realize that to die daily, that source of power comes through the name, comes through the source of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word Christ is taken out there of the New International Version. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse number 16 here, what the NIV does, again, another example of where they attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know according to the scriptures that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is God. And this is a great verse, again, which the Jehovah's Witnesses, which the Mormons, which the Mohammedans would love to turn to in an NIV to prove that uh, Jesus Christ is not God. Whereas in the authorized version, straight away, you can see that Jesus Christ is God based in this verse here. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, look what it says. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. When was God manifest in the flesh? God was manifest in the flesh in the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Lord Jesus Christ is God. We know that. The scriptures make that very clear to us. And this, and on the authorized version, it makes it very clear it was God that was manifest in the flesh. Very clear, very simple for you to understand. So what does the NIV do when it comes to this verse? It removes the word God and replaces it with the word He. So again, there's no power in this verse and in attacking the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why not just leave it with God? God was manifest in the flesh. What's so hard to understand about that? You know, they talk about, oh, the NIV, it's, it's easier to read. Uh, it's not archaic like the, like the authorized version. It doesn't have difficult words in it. What's so difficult about the word God? God was manifest in the flesh. Take out God, replace it with He. Again, you can see another example that there's another spirit behind the new international version all right those are the all the examples i'm going to show you like i said there's plenty more in the new international version i didn't want to go over the top with them just give you sufficient to, to see for yourselves that wow that book is a dangerous book but i just want to leave you now with with two more um, examples in the new international version uh, what they do when it comes uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if what I've shown you thus far in the previous two teachings and what we've seen uh, thus far in this, in this teaching, if it hasn't convinced you yet that uh, Satan is behind the New International Version, then these two examples, I trust, will um, convince you and make uh, you uh, fully persuaded and 100% uh, confirmed in your own heart that uh, Satan is behind the New International Version. So let's uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And let me just show you two references here in the Scriptures that prove to us that the Lord Jesus Christ was sinless. Now, we understand that the Lord Jesus Christ was sinless that there was no sin found in him, none whatsoever. He was the perfect, spotless Lamb of God without blemish, undefiled, holy, pure. Two references to support this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So it says, who knew no sin. The Lord Jesus Christ was sinless. Another example here, look with me in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and look at verse number 15. We read this, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, talking about Jesus Christ, but was in all points tempted like as we are, look what it says, yet without 
sin. So we see that the Lord Jesus Christ was sinless. Now, the New International Version agrees with this statement because in these two verses, uh, they pretty much say the same thing, that Lord Jesus Christ was without sin. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter 5. And let's look at verse 21. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking here. He says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now I want you to pay close attention here to verse 22 uh, in the authorized version as well as in the New International Version. Because if you notice here in the authorized version, it reads that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. The New International Version takes out the wording without a cause. So according to the authorized version, it's okay to be angry. And yes, we ought to be angry at some things. We ought to be angry at sin, whether it's sin in our own lives or sin in the nation. We ought to be angry when we see uh, the state of the nation and the direction in which it's going. In. There's nothing wrong with, with being angry. The scriptures talk about a righteous uh, indignation. But according to the New International Version, it reads, Whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. It takes out the phrase without a cause. So the scriptures clearly tell us there is a time to be angry and there is a reason for us to be angry. But if you read the NIV, it says you're not allowed to be angry full stop because if you are, you're going to be in danger of the judgment. Now, go to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 3. Look what the... New International Version does here in Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, look at verse number, look at verse, so let's just pick it up here in verse number 1 for context. It says, And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a, had a withered hand. And they watched him, this is the religious leaders here, and those of the synagogue, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, the Lord Jesus Christ got angry. It says, Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. I want you to see from this verse that the Lord Jesus Christ got, got angry with this group of people here in the synagogue. And uh, it's very clear here in Mark 3, verse number 5, he got angry. Now, when you go back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 22, in the authorized version, Jesus says, yes, you're allowed to get angry, but you need to make sure that you have a cause or a reason behind that for being angry. The Lord Jesus Christ did there in, uh, in Mark chapter 3, verse number 5. You know, they didn't want him to heal this, this man with this, uh, with this sickness, uh, because they thought he was breaking uh, breaking the Sabbath. So the Lord Jesus Christ got angry with them, but he had a cause. Now, when you go to the NIV, it says that uh, in Matthew 5.22, it says, Whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. Well, when you go to Mark chapter 3 and verse 5 in the NIV, we read that the Lord Jesus Christ got angry. So according to the New International Version, the Lord Jesus Christ sinned when he got angry. So what does the NIV do to the Lord Jesus Christ there in that verse? The, Lord, the NIV makes the Lord Jesus Christ a sinner. Well, didn't the NIV just say in those two references in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in Hebrews chapter 4 that the Lord Jesus Christ was sinless? There you have a contradiction in the New International Version. Not only is it a contradiction, but we see in the New International Version that the Lord Jesus Christ is guilty of sinning and committing the sin of being angry. You don't find that in the authorized version. So who would want the Lord Jesus Christ sinning? I'll tell you who'd want the Lord Jesus Christ sinning. The devil would want the Lord Jesus Christ sinning because if the devil could uh, get the Lord Jesus Christ to sin, then he can no longer be uh, the, the, the sinless, spotless uh, sacrifice uh, for our sins. But you read in the NIV that the Lord Jesus Christ is found guilty of sinning. You won't find that in the authorized version. What a thing, mate. What a thing the NIV does. All right, one more example. I've been saving the best to last, as they say. 
All right, Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter number 14. Now, you've got to look at this one closely. Isaiah chapter 14. Look at verse number 12. In the authorized version, we read this. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven? Who is he referring to? Well, look what it says in the next two words. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which dis weaken the nations? So we know the context here in Isaiah 14 verse 12 is referring to Lucifer. And in the authorized version, he's called son of the morning. Now, the New International Version takes out the word son of the morning and refers to Lucifer as the morning star. They insert the word morning star. Now, you may say that's that's not a big difference. That's, that's not a big change. Well, let's have a look at what Revelation says. Go to the last book of your scriptures. Revelation chapter 22. I said you've got to look at it closely. Make sure you look at it closely. Revelation chapter two, 22. Look at verse 16. Who's speaking here? I, Jesus. Okay. In Isaiah, we saw that it was in reference to Lucifer. In Revelation 22 verse 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am. There's the I am, just like we read there in Exodus. Again, deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's throughout the scriptures. It really is. It says, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The Lord Jesus Christ refers to himself as the morning star. Well, hang on a minute. What did the New International Version call Lucifer there in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12? Didn't the New International Version in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 take out the word son of the morning and replace it with morning star? Yes, they did. Check it out again. Have a look at it one more time. Isaiah 14 verse 12 in the New International Version takes out son of the morning and replaces it with morning star. Who is the morning star according to the authorized version in Revelation 22 and verse 16? The morning star is the Lord Jesus Christ. So what has that satanic version of the scriptures just done when it comes to Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 and Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. They have referred to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lucifer, as Satan. They've taken that name of morning star that the Lord Jesus Christ owns and used it to describe Lucifer or Satan, however you want to describe him there in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. And you're telling me, not you, but these people out there who use the New International Version and believe that that is the Holy Scriptures for the day, that uh, there's not a satanic spirit behind that book. How could you use a book? How could you read a book that refers to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lucifer? You will not find it here in the Authorized Version. Hence, you can see the spirit behind the New International Version and the author behind the New International Version. The translators are all led by another spirit, and that spirit came from Satan. That is a satanic version. That is a satanic book. Why? Because it brings doubt upon the words of God. It defiles the word of God by adding and subtracting, and it deceives concerning the words of God. Uh, by mixing truth with error, just like Satan did there in the garden. Let me finish off here in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Are you fully persuaded in your own mind? Are you 100% convinced, not what I've told you, but what the evidence says when it's placed down in front of you about the New International Version? And again, as I've said before, we're just looking at the New International Version, but all these other versions on the market come from the same line of manuscripts like the New International Version do, does as well. So you'll find these changes in all these other versions as well. We'll talk about the New King James Version in our next message, okay, before we get ahead of ourselves. But let me just finish off here in Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse number 15. We read this. Now the context here is in reference to false prophets. The Lord Jesus Christ is referring, uh, is speaking, and is warning the people about false prophets. But I want to use this as just a devotional application here because uh, these things can be said of the New International Version as well. 
And uh, let me just show you the comparison here. It says, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So these false prophets, it says that uh, um, they come in sheep's clothing, all, all uh, calm and, uh, and gentle and pleasant to the eye, but inwardly they are a ravening wolf. Can I say that's exactly what the New International Version is? You know, you'll find the New International Version at your, at your local bookstore. But yeah, on the outside, you know what they have today? They've got these nice, uh, colourful um, uh, covers on, on their Bibles and, and, and different uh, uh, designs, uh, different sizes. And, and yes, on the, on the outside, it looks so perfect. It looks so pure. It looks so lovely. But inwardly, oh, it's a different story inwardly with the words, with the, with the changes that have been made, with the attacks on Bible teachings and, uh, and Bible truths as, as well as the truth, just like these false prophets. Uh, inwardly, they raven in wolves. It says in verse 16, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Look what it says in verse 17, Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. You've seen the fruit of the New International Version, and you've seen the fruit of the Authorized Version. You've seen through the evidence what version of scriptures gives the Lord Jesus Christ the preeminent place that elevates up the Lord Jesus Christ and which, which version demotes the Lord Jesus Christ. It says every tree, um, so every, so, sorry, even so every good tree bringing forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringing forth evil fruit. There's evil fruit being produced from the New International Version. There's good fruit that comes from reading the authorized version. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. You know, that is going to be the destination of the New International Version one of these days. It's going to be cast into the fire and it's going to perish and it's going to cease to exist. Why? Because it brings forth evil fruit. Why? Because it's an evil source. Is the same going to be true of the authorized version? No, it's not. Because in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, these words that we have in front of us, shall not pass away. And as we already read before in the scriptures, that uh, God's word, it says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And that's the book that you have in front of us. And that's the book that we've been studying when it comes to the attacks on the Holy Scriptures. So I'll leave it there with the NIV. Again, if you have any uh, questions or comments, not sure about something, please let me know. I'll do my best to answer those uh, questions. And then Lord willing, we'll start looking at the New King James uh, Version uh, in our next message. God bless. Swift to